Welcome to Vancouver Business Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I'm Roger Killen, the organizer. Our speaker is Mr. Tyler Basu. Tyler helps entrepreneurs create content that drives qualified traffic, leads, and sales to their businesses. Since 2013, Tyler has produced 500 plus pieces of content, driving millions of views, tens of thousands of leads, and thousands of customers for various companies. Vancouver Business Network members and most welcome guests, it's now time for me to invite you to put your hands together and give Mr. Tyler Basu a warm BBN welcome. All right, thanks so much for being here. Really appreciate it. This training that I put together is specifically for entrepreneurs on how to create and promote content that helps grow your business, that actually drives leads and sales for your business. Now, before we dive in, I, I like to get a sense of some of the challenges and frustrations that entrepreneurs have with content. And we asked this question um, before uh, and during the networking break. So I, I, th I got a bit of an idea, but I just wanted to recap to make sure I I guess some of the top challenges here. So one of the ones I heard was I don't have time to create content. Can I see a show of hands if any of you feel like you don't have time? Okay. Another one I heard was I don't know what to what topics to cover. I don't know what type of content or what to, to create or what to say in my content. Can anybody relate to that? Okay. Uh, promoting content, systems for promoting, distributing, where to promote your content. Um, is anybody struggling with that particular step? Okay. How about converting people who consume your content into leads for your business and sales opportunities for your business? Almost every hand, almost every hand went up. Okay, so I'll make sure we spend some time on that. Interrupt me at any point. I tend to speak quickly, so if I'm going too fast, if you want me to clarify something, if you have a question, just uh, raise your hand, I'll repeat the question so that every, everyone can hear, uh, and then I'll make sure I get that question answered. Uh, but my goal is really simple, is to show you a proven five-step framework for creating content, promoting that content, and actually driving some leads and some sales for your business. So now you're probably wondering, who is this kid? Why isn't he in school and why should I hear him talk about <laughs> content marketing? So uh, uh, very briefly, I'll tell you how I learned to grow businesses with content so that you can see that every, everything I'm about to share comes from experience. And then I'll dive into the good stuff because I know you're not here to hear uh, the life story. But I didn't actually start as a marketer. My first job was sales, door-to-door -door sales, 100% commission, Six days a week, I was knocking on doors selling TV, internet, home phone. The reason I share this with you is because I so much appreciate marketing now because I only ever talk to somebody that has consumed content and been through marketing and actually applied to speak with me. So that sales conversation is much easier. This is the complete opposite of that, going, doing door to door. Does anybody know why this type of sales is, is the hardest type of sales to do? What's your, what's your guess? Me? Yeah. Okay. Strangers and they all know who you are. Yeah. Strain, you're, you're talking to strangers. They don't know who you are. You're going to... You got three seconds. You got three seconds. The, the reason why cold calling and door-to-door -door is so tough is because there is zero marketing that's done on your behalf. My, my, my work day was assigned a neighborhood. I would get dropped off in a neighborhood, and all I would have is a tracking sheet of the addresses the houses I knocked on. I don't know who I'm talking to. I don't know if they want to hear from me. I don't know if they like the company I'm selling for or not. I don't know if they're in the market or not. I don't know if it's the right person. I got to figure that stuff out by just knocking on the door and talking to them. That, so that was a numbers game. I would have to talk to 50 plus people a day just to find one or two or three customers because again, zero marketing. So it's just strictly a numbers game. My life got a little bit easier when I got into real estate and I worked out of a presentation center, and people would come into the presentation center to learn about the, the homes that were for sale, and it was my job to figure out which home they, they might wanna buy. Can you guess why this was a little bit easier than door to door? Customer came, customer came to me. Pardon? Qualified leads. Nobody walks into this presentation center unless they're at least a tiny bit interested in uh, one of the homes that's being built. I was selling for developers. So that's where I learned to appreciate marketing 
because my job as a salesperson all of a sudden became way easier. I only had to talk to 10 or 20 people a day and those 10 or 20 people at least had some information and some interest before they got to me. During that time, I started creating content online. I started my first blog, started my first podcast, started publishing eBooks. This was back in 2013 while I was still working as a realtor. That's my little home office in my basement where I started my first uh, podcast. And then in 2015, I made the decision to leave real estate. And I ended up um, working for a company called Thinkific. This is a startup in Vancouver that needed some help with their content marketing. So 2016, I came in as uh, employee number 12, started helping them on their blog, eventually their YouTube, eventually their webinars, eventually their courses, their social media. And over the course of three years, ended up creating hundreds of pieces of content and driving uh, millions of views to all that content, tens of thousands of leads, thousands of customers. When I left Thinkific at the beginning of 2019 in January, it had grown in that three year period from 12 employees to about 80 full-time employees here in Vancouver, a couple of thousand customers to more than 35,000 customers. We didn't even have a salesperson during those three years. Does anybody have a guess as to why there was no salesperson? How did we get those customers? Marketing. 100% marketing. Word of mouth, marketing, partnerships, content. They just now hired a salesperson to, to serve the, uh, the enterprise type of customers for that market. And it's still an inbound salesperson. It's not an outbound salesperson. So I've been on, I share this story just to, so that you see that I've been on both ends of the spectrum. I've been on the end of the spectrum where my job was to create sales and there was zero marketing. And I've been on the other end of the spectrum where there's no salesperson and the marketing has to do all of the selling and the content has to do all of the selling. Now I'm somewhere in the middle. I create content that drives leads and then I get on the phone to talk to those leads because I want to talk to somebody before I take them on as a client. Is anybody else in that same scenario where you won't take on a client unless you actually talk to them, make sure they're a good fit? So, okay, so there's a few people here that uh, speak to somebody before you sell to them. Okay, good. So I think you'll get some value from this. So there's five things I want to cover. And again, stop me at any point if you want me to go deeper or provide clarity on any one of these steps. Uh, but I'm going to show you how to choose topics for your content, how to decide what type of content to create, how to promote that content so that it gets seen by your target audience, um, and how to convert people who read your articles or listen to a podcast or watch a video or just kind of follow you on social media, how to convert them. Um, into leads for your business and then from there you either hand it to a salesperson or you you know that that that, that kick starts the beginning of whatever your sales process is so content marketing doesn't need to replace your sales process if you have a sales process that works and it probably starts with a conversation then the job of content is to get people all the way up to requesting that conversation with you so that you only speak to people that already know you already trust you consumed your content, know what you do, and they're just trying to figure out if it's the right fit, what you charge, and what it would look like to work with you. Does that make sense? Um, so before we dive in, there's three myths that I see floating around, kind of the online marketing uh, and content marketing world. You might have heard some of these myths, and I just want to address these up front in case any of you believe that these things are true. Uh, I'll show you why they're not true. The first you might have heard this, that you're just one funnel away. Has anybody heard this before? Been told that you need a sales funnel or, and that's the only thing that you need? Okay, the reason why this is a myth and why I see a lot of entrepreneurs get tripped up on I need a funnel, I need a webinar, you know, I need an automated funnel, automated client acquisition, I don't wanna to talk to anybody, I just want it all done, you know, happening on autopilot. Here's one of the reasons why most of you um, don't need to focus so much on building automated funnels. The type of people that funnels work on are the type of people that are looking for uh, a solution today. Like they know what their problem is. They're, they're trying to find who can help them solve that problem. So they'll go through a funnel, a marketing funnel or a sales funnel to figure out if you're the person they want to buy from. So that might mean they see your ad, they watch your webinar, they book a call and they become a client and all of that happens in a very short period of time. Raise your hand if you can remember even at any point in the past year where you spent a few hundred or a few thousand dollars 
on somebody's product or service, and that was the way you bought from them. You saw an ad, you went through a marketing funnel, you booked a call, or you went to a sales page, and you became their customer immediately in a short period of time. And I see a show of hands if you've bought that way before. Okay, one, one or two. So that's because you were, you were in that moment probably looking for, for a specific product or service, correct? And then you saw that person's sales funnel or marketing funnel, you went through it, you learned about their, their offer, and you decided that was the right offer for you. So 3% of any market is generally the people that are looking for that, looking to buy today, like they're ready now or in the next couple of days. So you just have to present your offer in front of them at the right time. Now for the rest of the market, the 97% that aren't ready today, that means they're gonna be ready a few weeks from now or a few months from now or even a year from now or longer. And so how do you nurture them over that period of time? Because this is what their buyer's journey is gonna more realistically look like. They're gonna see your piece of content or your ad, then they're gonna to decide to follow you on social media, then they're gonna hop onto your email list, and they might jump into your Facebook group, then they might start listening to your podcast or watching your videos, reading your emails, seeing more content, seeing more ads, finally watching that webinar that you put together, then going and checking out to see if you have case studies or testimonial. There's this whole series of 10 or 20 or 30 touch points that they're doing that they're basically um, checking you out and spying on you before they finally reach out and say, hey, I wanna work with you now. Raise your hand if you've bought from somebody and your process of buying from them was more like, more like this. It was spread over a long period of time. You spied on them for a bit. You did your research. You consumed their content. You read their emails. And then after several weeks or several months, you decided to become their client. So did I see most of, most of the hands in the room went up? Okay, perfect. So that proves why a marketing funnel isn't the end-all be-all solution to everything that you need. You got to have it so that those people that are looking for something today there's a process to take them from first learning about you to becoming a client. But for everybody else that's going to take their time and take a few weeks, you got to nurture them. You got to earn their trust and they, you got to um, in, just invest in that relationship before they actually buy from you. That's where content creation comes in. Because if you look at this path here, it's the very end of the path where somebody finally booked the call or visited the sales page and decided to become a client. Everything that came before that, is a, is a type of content. Uh, an ad is a type of content. An update on social media is a type of content. An email is a piece of content. If you've got a Facebook group or a LinkedIn group, that you're probably sharing content in that group. So you've got all of these pieces of content that essentially do your nurturing for you until somebody is ready to buy and then that, that triggers your sales process. Does that make sense? The second myth, you need a bigger audience. Raise your hand if you've been told you need to focus on growing your audience. You need a bigger audience. You need more followers. You need more readers. You need more viewers. Bigger audience. Okay. I have a question for you. How, how big of an audience do you think you need? You get any answers? What, like, what's the magic number? 1,000 true fans. 1,000 true fans. Okay. That's a good number. Does everybody, is everyone familiar with the true fans concept? Um, there's a great article out there. You can find it if you search for 1,000 true fans, which basically says if any business really only needs 1,000 raving fans who buy everything you create and share everything you, you publish um, to start seeing some really great growth. If you had 1,000 people that really love what you do, believe in what you do, and buy everything you, you create. If all of you had 1,000 people like that, would you be doing pretty good? Okay, awesome. So back to the question of how big of an audience do you need? Is there a magic number for how, how large of a following you need online, do you think? 1,000. 1,000, okay. That's not just followers though, that's the true fans, right? That's not a casual follower or somebody who hit your blog and you never heard from them again. That's like a 1,000 engaged people that buy and share your stuff. <laughs> this headline popped up in my newsfeed a few weeks back. Some of you might have seen it. There was an Instagram influencer with 2.6 million followers. They couldn't sell 36 t-shirts. The influencer bubble is bursting. That was the headline. Now I share this just to prove a point that if all you do is focus on growing an audience, and even if you get that audience into several millions, that that might not be the right audience. That just focusing on the size of your audience is a vanity metric if those people are not your target audience, if they're not your ideal clients, and if you didn't create a process for selling a product or service 
to them, if there's no path for them to going from being a follower to being a client. This person who had 2 million followers either didn't attract followers who buy t-shirts or didn't have a path for them to follow to buy those t-shirts. Because if you've got 2.6 million followers that are actually your target audience, you don't have to be the best salesperson to, uh, to sell them a product or service. The third myth, has anybody heard this, that you can just hire a virtual assistant to do your marketing for you? Has anybody heard that or been told that, that hey, you can just outsource this stuff? Two people. So one of the reasons why I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs struggle to outsource the marketing. They know they need to do it. They know they need to create content, but they, they just try to hand it off to somebody else um, that doesn't quite understand their business or doesn't quite understand who their client is or their, or their, or their branding or any of that stuff. And then, and then it ends up not working. So just to give you a sense of what the role of content marketing entails, I pulled this, um, this is actually from the, from the United States. This is the average annual salary of a full-time content marketing manager, about 65,000 US per year. If you're in Canada, with the exchange rate, that's like $8 million per year. So, <laughs> kidding, of course. But what that means is that for most small business owners, to have somebody full-time focused on content creation, content promotion, tracking, if it's actually working, that role is worth to the marketplace about 65,000 per year. So if you're a small business owner and you've maybe got a team of under five or 10 people, maybe one or two of which is focused on marketing, it's a pretty big investment to decide that that's, that that's what you're gonna allocate just to your, your content. Uh, your content marketing. So my goal today is to show you what a content marketer does, what that role entails, to show you that process, but then you as the entrepreneur, as the CEO of your business, you need to recognize that your time needs to be worth more than most of the activities that go into editing content and promoting content and all that stuff or being in the weeds. The best use of your time is to be involved in the content creation process because you're the one that has the insights on your product or service. You're the one that, that has the expertise. So the best use of your time is you sharing that expertise, but everything that happens afterwards, editing, publishing, scheduling, tracking, all that stuff, um, that should be given to somebody else. And if you're not ready to grab a full-time content marketer, those roles can be divided up, given to freelancers, and you could manage a couple of freelancers instead as an alternative. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna dive into the five-step five, five step strategy to creating promote, uh, content to promote your business. Step one is deciding what to say. So I call that topic selection. Now before we dive into topic selection, I wanna caveat this by saying that it's super important that you know who your ideal client is. Before you even think about marketing or creating content in the first place, you gotta get really, really clear on who you actually want as a client, who, who's the perfect client? Can I see a show of hands, those of you who have actually created some kind of a persona or description of who your favorite type of client is? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, good, so that's at least half the room, half the room. Um, who needs to do that? Who needs to define who their perfect client is? Okay, so if any of you need help with that part, um, reach out to me afterwards. I've got a, a client persona template I'll share with you. So you can start to fill out based on what you know about the people you like working with, you start to create a, a persona of how, how you describe that person, their, their demographics, their interests, um, why they would buy from you, all that, all that type of stuff. You start to articulate that stuff. So that's you know step zero, before you actually choose uh, the topics for your content, is choose who you want to attract with your content. And then you go to work on deciding what you're gonna talk about in your content. So here's a very simple framework for coming up with topic ideas. Pain, gain, process, three categories, okay? People are motivated in two ways, generally. Either to avoid a pain or to gain a pleasure of some kind. Like, to get away from something or to go towards something. And that's how you get somebody's attention. You gotta talk about the things that they're trying to avoid. You gotta talk about their challenges, their frustrations, their fears. Because um, those are the things you're trying to get away from. That's a whole category of content right there. The challenges, the frustrations, and the fears that your ideal client has that are related to what it is that you help them with. 
The second category of topics is the gains. Okay, what are the goals? The actual goals that they have. What what's the outcome that they would hire you to accomplish? What are some of their aspirations? Who do they want to be? Who who do they want to be like? You got to know that stuff too. Um, and then you create a list of uh, topic ideas that are based on the things that your clients want, not just the stuff that they're trying to get away from. Um, once you have once you have clarity on those two things, create a third list of topic ideas where you teach your process, your expertise. Like what is it that you help somebody do? Break it up into steps, and then those steps become pieces of content. The reason why you need the pain and the gain stuff though is because if you just go out there and you just share how-to content all the time and you just teach your process, what do you think somebody's gonna, um, their reaction's gonna be if all they see from you is educational, hey, here's my three steps or my five steps, or this is how you do this and how you do that. Unless they understand why they should care about your process, they're not gonna care. Does that make sense? So you gotta talk about what are they trying to avoid? What are they trying to gain? So that they realize, okay, you're gonna help me avoid this problem or you're gonna help me get that result. Now I'll pay attention to your process. How are you gonna get me there? So you need the three types of content. Are there any questions on how to come up with topic ideas for your content? Doing okay so far? Okay, awesome. So you're gonna go through that framework. Um, I'll share some worksheets and some free, uh, a link to get some worksheets and free resources so that you can implement all this stuff. If you are taking notes, um, that helps. But if, if you want um, some frameworks for each one of these steps, I'll make sure I share some stuff with you afterwards. Um, once you have a list of those topic ideas, the next step is to start creating some content. And there's different types. The main three are video, audio, text. Okay, so video, um, we can do with our phones now. Okay, the barrier to entry to creating video has gotten a lot lower. Um, audio typically means podcast, and text typically means articles. Like you writing blog posts for your own site or for, or for other publications online. Is anybody having a hard time choosing which type of content to focus on primarily? If you're choosing between video, uh, audio, or text, does anybody need help deciding which one you should focus on? Uh, yeah. Visual, yeah, I would say visual is the fourth category, which would be uh, images, yeah. Yeah, for sure, that falls into part of it. But it's hard to teach um, with visual. So visuals can often support, uh, support what you're trying to accomplish with content. Um, but you so you'll probably need more than just pictures, though. You'll need because you'll need context to yeah, go with the pictures. Example, Infographics are an example of a visual where there's um, yeah there's information inside of the visual. So yeah, that would fall into the visual category. Even slide decks, you know, that you might see on slide shares, uh, even webinars, can fall a little bit into the visual category as well. Um, if you're just if you're if you're just starting today from day one of Okay, I'm gonna start creating content. My recommendation would be to start with video. 10 years ago, most people were excited about starting a blog. Five years ago, podcasts started getting some attention. Today, over 80% of the traffic online is video content. Almost everybody watches videos. So if you start with video, you're not alienating anyone. If you started with a podcast, you're, you're alienating people that don't listen to podcasts. And if you start with focusing on a blog, you're alienating people that don't read blogs. But if you start with video, not only does almost everyone watch video, it's also the easiest to turn into other types of content. Like you can pull the audio out of a video, now you've got a podcast. You can give it to a writer and say, hey, create an article on, uh, based on this video. A writer can do that. So I would say start with video because it takes the least amount of time. You don't need fancy equipment. You can pull out your phone and do a video share your expertise for a few minutes and then, and uh, later in this presentation I'll show you um, we'll talk about repurposing that that one, what you can do with one video to make sure that it reaches a lot of a lot of people um, but regardless of which type whether you're doing articles podcasts videos a very simple framework anytime you create a piece of content and I'm not talking about like a quick update for social media I mean something that you want to live on the internet for a long time um, that will that is evergreen and that continues to bring visitors and leads for your business. If it's evergreen content, I recommend following this structure. 
because for each piece of content that you create, think about the current reality of your target audience. What's their point A right now? What are they facing? What are they trying to get to? What's the desired reality? And then break that process of getting there into some steps, into some tips, right? So that way every piece of content should tell somebody up front, hey, if, you're, if this is you and you're trying to get here, here's some tips or some steps that are gonna help you, right? If you organize all of your educational content into that kind of a framework, people like logical steps and they like knowing where you're gonna take them with your content. So if you tell them up front, hey, in this video or in this article, I'm gonna show you how to get over here, here are the steps, and then you wrap it up with a conclusion of, hey, well, here's the next step once you're here. Does that make sense? A lot of people ask me, how do I create viral content? How do I get content to go viral? I tell them that viral content is a byproduct. You can't say, I'm creating this piece of viral content. What you can do though, is uh, follow the recipe that results in content that gets shared and that gets liked and that um, goes viral. And, and by viral, I mean even just being shared within your industry, right? We don't need, if you want something to go viral and be seen by millions, you should probably just go home and record a video of your cat or your dog and then share that. Um, and then probably a million people would want to watch that, but that's not really going to help your business. Um, so going viral in the context of helping your business means sharing something that your target audience likes and they all share it and they all comment on it and they all engage with it. So the three ingredients to get there is it's got to be useful. You got to share something that's useful to your target audience. You got to entertain them in some way. It's got to be engaging great way to do that is with a story, right? Don't just share dry, you know, here's three steps, but share a story or an example so that you can, they can see. Um, and then finally, step number three is it's got to inspire some action. You got to give them a next step to take. If you, if your content doesn't give somebody a, a next step, they'll consume it and they'll be like, Oh, that's nice. Thank you. But I don't really know what to do next. So off I go. So there's always got to be a next step. So if you have those three ingredients in your piece of content, then it's much more likely to be shared uh, and to get good engagement online. Um, so that's some suggestions on creating content. Step number three, yeah, which is a question. Uh, yes, with regards to excess content, yep. do posts count or would you only consider a blog uh, in the realm of creating content? Yeah, so, so the question is, uh, does posting on social media count as content versus yeah, publishing on a blog? Yeah, um, it totally counts. Um, I've seen quite a few people and even some clients that only post on social media and they're getting traction there. They're getting calls in their calendar. They're getting leads from social media. Um, when I would say to publish on your website, like a blog, for example, is if you want that stuff to live online for a long time, right? Evergreen. The goal is probably long-term traffic to the website ranking for keywords and search engines, that kind of stuff. The, the, the lifespan of content on social media is not very long, right? You can post something really good. Maybe you spent an hour writing a thousand word post that's super valuable. You share it on your Facebook page and three or four days from now, nobody sees it anymore, right? Um, unless, you're, unless you've got ads running continuously sharing content on social, the, the shelf life of content on social is pretty short. Um, so if you want that longer term benefit, you should probably publish it on a platform you own, uh, like your website. So step number three is publishing. Uh, now, regardless of which type of content you publish, I recommend treating this kind of like a production line. Every piece of content goes through these stages of, of production from creating it, editing it, publishing it, promoting it. So I use a, uh, a software called Asana as a project management tool. Not saying it's the only one you need to use, but I recommend using some form of project management tool so that you can just define those stages that a piece of content goes through. Um, on, on the screen here, you'll see that those stages are create and edit. So there's a column for that. The next stage is draft, schedule. There's a column for that. After that, publish and promote. There's a column for that. And after that, the final stage is completed. Um, and each one of those stages has steps of you know, what's, what's being done in that, in that stage. So for a blog post, for example, the creation stage would have something like choosing the headline, um, creating an outline for the article, 
writing it yourself or finding a writer, proofreading it, editing it, all this stuff. There's, you know, quite a few steps. So you just want to define what those steps are. Your job as entrepreneurs is to create these systems in your business so that these things can happen without you. So you might want to be a part of creating this production line where you decide Here's the type of content we're going to publish consistently. We're going to do articles or we're going to do videos or we're going to do a podcast. Here are the steps involved in creating, publishing and promoting that content. And then you just create the checklist so that you can hand it off to other people. If you've got anyone on your team, you can hand it to, or if you want to train freelancers or work with an agency, the, the, the process exists um, for that content. So, um, there's no one size fits all like every piece of content will have a different way of creating it, right? You don't, you don't edit a video the same way you edit a blog post. So depending on the type of content that you decide you're going to create, you would just create, um, this unique list of list of tasks for that checklist, save it as a template. And that way you've got this production line where if you want to do a video every week, your job is to pull out the camera, talk for a few minutes, boom, there's your video. You put that on your production line. And you've got other people that come in and do all the other tasks that individually are usually not worth a whole lot. Like the task of editing a video, it's not worth it. Not worth a lot. Certainly not worth more than you being on the phone with a client or you creating an, another product or service for your business. So that's why you want to create the system is so that you can take the system off your plate as quickly as possible. Any questions on the publishing process? If, if there's anything specific or even about a specific type of content, I'm happy to answer that. Roger's got a question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Shooting video with my cell phone. I then tried to email it and to realize that if you have anything more than five seconds of video, yeah. you're not going to email it. How do people uh, transmit video yeah. that, that is shot on their cell phone? Okay, so the question was, how do I, uh, if I record a video on my cell phone, how do I give it to somebody else to handle the editing and take it from there? if it's a big file. Uh, file sharing. So the answer is uh, agree on a file sharing system for your business. I like Google Drive. Some people use Dropbox. Um, but the next step for you would be you record the video on your phone, plug your phone into your computer, you gotta pull the video file off of it and upload it to Google Drive. And then that way you tag an editor or whoever the next person in the production line is. They go into Google Drive, grab your video file and they do their stuff there. They do the editing and that's where also where they put the final video file as they upload it back to Google Drive. So you just got to agree on the way that you share files internally. Google Drive and Dropbox are probably the two most popular file sharing programs. Right. OneDrive is another one. Okay, OneDrive is a, is a good one. So is there a service you can charge for large files? Like selective as simple charge for large files? Okay. So the website, there's a website called Transfer transferlargefiles.com okay yeah okay awesome yeah awesome so if anybody didn't hear that one of the one of the things you can do is just get google drive on your phone and that way when you've recorded a video on your phone or, or dropbox on your phone get the app and that way you don't, you can bypass your computer completely and just upload the video file straight from your phone to Google Drive or to Dropbox. Yes, question? Uh, so about four or five years ago when people started doing the video blogging on YouTube and whatnot, mm -hmm. at that time, people didn't really care too much about the quality of video mm -hmm. and lighting. Mm -hmm. They just cared that it was interesting and good content. Mm -hmm. Well, two years ago, there seemed to be a shift. Now people started to care about the quality of video, making sure it looks yeah. good and whatnot. And today, even a lot of teenage YouTubers are paying attention to lighting and yeah. ring lights and making, you know, so in your opinion today, seeing how it's shifted, okay, mm -hmm. do you think having video that doesn't look like it's the best still works if the content's good? Or is a combination of good content, good looking video, good direction, now necessary to compete? So the question is, how, how, how much should I prioritize production quality of video content, right? Um, so the good news is that it, it's, it's become very inexpensive to create pretty, pretty good looking video. 10 years ago, you, needed to, you would have needed to spend a lot of money on equipment. Today, 
as you mentioned, you've got teenagers that have a good phone, they attach a little lighting kit um, or, and maybe a good mic, and then that's pretty decent video quality. So you don't actually, you don't need a whole studio, you don't have to spend a crazy amount of money. If you have a good phone, I recommend, I recommend getting one of those lapel mics that connects to your shirt, because the sound quality in video is actually really, really important. Um, if you had a very good video camera and the sound was bad, it kind of, it, it, it takes away from the experience of the viewer because they're going to be so bothered by the bad sound. So invest in sound just as much as you invest in video. Uh, and there are things you can get lighting kits, um, you know, from Amazon, you can get for your home or your home or, or your office, one or 200 bucks for a basic lighting kit. You can even get the little ones that go on your phone, little ring lighting kits. Um, if you're publishing on YouTube, again, which is, a, you know, the, the goal there is long-term visibility, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a large search engine, so you shouldn't be treating YouTube the same way that you would treat, you know, Instagram or Facebook, where um, you're probably posting a lot more. On YouTube, you, you might want to post less frequently and put some extra time into creating a good, a good video, because that's an asset that now lives online. It's going to live online for a long time. Um, something that you just only share on social media uh, is not going to um, not going to live there for a long time unless you turn it into an ad and pay to promote it as an ad. Um, so the stuff that you share on social media can be way less polished, and people are okay with that. Um, in fact, sometimes the polished video I've run tests and I've seen polished video versus not so polished video on social media. I've seen the unpolished ones do better because the really polished ones look like ads look like ads on social. Um, on YouTube, again, if the goal is long-term strategy, and we want to create a bunch of video assets that live there and, and continue to drive traffic for you, then probably spend a little bit extra time on the production quality. Um, good question, by the way. Uh, step number four, once you've created content, it's time to distribute it. Um, I will say there's no one size fits all. Uh, where you promote your content entirely depends on where you think your target audience is, right? Don't promote, don't spend time focusing on Instagram just because somebody told you to focus on Instagram if there's no evidence at all that your audience uses Instagram. Does that make sense? So the number one question I always ask at every step of this process is who am I trying to reach? You know, who is, who am I trying to reach with this? Because uh, that'll dictate where and how you promote your content. Um, once you know where your audience hangs out, then you go and you create the steps of, okay, if I know that my audience is on LinkedIn and I know they're on uh, Facebook, I'm gonna spend most of my promotion efforts on sharing my content on those two platforms. Um, so that's part of distribution is choosing where to share your content. The other part is repurposing. Because if you spend five minutes to record a video, don't think that, that, that you only have one piece of content there. You've got a five minute video and that's your, your first piece of content, but you can take that video and you can repurpose it into so many other forms of content so that you're not constantly in a race to create new stuff. You can, you can reuse what you've already got um, because certain formats do better on certain platforms. Like you can take one video, just as an example, take one video, and that video in its normal format as a horizontal video that you record on your phone or with a camera would do well on YouTube, it would do well on Facebook, would do well on, on LinkedIn. But if you took out, if you had your editor pull out a vertical version of that, where do verticals videos go? Vertical, vertical videos, stories, Instagram stories, Facebook, Facebook stories, Instagram TV, right? So you didn't have to create a second video but all of a sudden now you've got the right format for three other places to share that video. You could have the editor pull out a square version of the video, maybe put a, a headline on top and some captions down below. Where does a square video do, do really well? Facebook does well, Instagram, as a, norm, as a regular post on Instagram, you can use a square video. You could, LinkedIn. yeah, LinkedIn, it would do well there as well. You can pull quotes out of the video or even get it, get it transcribed and get somebody to pull some of your best insights out of the transcription. What can you do with quotes? Instagram. Instagram, create the picture quotes, right? So I, I would bet you that if you did just a three minute video, you could probably pull three quotes. That would be one quote per minute. 
and now you've got three branded image quotes of you sharing your expertise with your name or your company logo and that works great for uh, for Instagram even for the other social platforms as well you could pull the audio give that to somebody who knows how to how to create a podcast episode for you they just add the intro and the outro and now you've got a podcast episode so how many how many pieces of content are we up to now just from this one video so far we've got horizontal vertical square image quotes podcast episode you could have a writer turn it into an article take what you said in the video and actually rewrite it uh, so that it reads like an article. Now you've got something for your blog or to submit as a guest post to another publication. So we're up to like seven pieces of content. So your whole content strategy could be that you just record one video per week, but then you have somebody come in and do all the repurposing for you. Now you've got daily content for all of your social media and it only took you five minutes of content creation time per week. It's important that we protect our time as entrepreneurs. Like the role of content marketers is, you know, it, it can be a full-time role, but it shouldn't be your full-time role. So you want to not be on the entire production line of this process. You want to be involved in knowing who your, who your ideal client is, what topics to create, creating the content, and then editing, repurposing, publishing, scheduling, tracking, all that stuff. Um, you can you can train freelancers. You can train junior marketers to do that stuff um, But it shouldn't it shouldn't be you. D does that make sense? <laughs> uh, these are the four main categories of distributing content The first one is organic which basically means sharing with your existing audience You're sharing it on, on social media all your social media platforms you email uh, your your list of subscribers um, You could do some direct outreach share it with somebody that you know that you think it would help send them a direct message be like hey I just created this video I think this might help you. I got this article it might help you um, the organic stuff is is you trading some time to share it with your existing network your existing audience category number two is paying paying to promote running ads to your content where you're targeting uh, the people that you want to reach you can do this on Facebook you can do this with Instagram you can do this even with YouTube with Google a lot of advertising platforms that let you decide who you want to run your ad to and then instead of running an ad that says hey buy my stuff you run an ad to your content so that you build a bit of trust um, with that person up front third category is referrals and PR um, I like to think of that as just getting in front of somebody else's audience go and you know uh, send one of your articles to another publication they've got they've got an audience that's already built reach out to affiliates that uh, that you'd be willing to pay if they promoted your stuff, right? They can share your content uh, PR go get interviewed you'll get interviewed for a YouTube channel or get interviewed for a podcast share the same insights that you share in your content already and finally step four is, is repurposing we talked about that a bit already but taking that content that you just created and it's in its original form and have somebody chop it up and repurpose it into other formats so that you're, you're maximizing the amount of people that it can reach. Somebody who's really good at this, since that's a really good example, is a guy named Gary Vaynerchuk. Can I just see a show of hands if you if you come across this person's content? So he's got um, what what I've been told is 20 people inside of his agency that are devoted just to recording and repurposing and promoting content from Gary V. He calls it the content pyramid. So he'll take a long form piece of content like a one of his daily video blogs or a clip from him giving a keynote presentation he'll have that repurposed into what he calls micro content uh, which can be articles memes images quotes stories all that kind of stuff and which then gets distributed across all of the social media and he's on all of it um, so this is like going to the extreme not all of you need to be as extreme in fact probably none of you need to be as extreme as Gary V he's somebody that has hundreds of people working inside of an agency for him, and his goal is for millions and millions of people to know who he is. Um, for for many of you, you know, a thousand true fans would probably do the trick. Even a few hundred uh, new, really engaged prospects on a monthly basis would probably move the needle for your business, right? Even sometimes, right down to just, hey, if I had five extra phone calls with prospects this week, that would move the needle for me. Um, so you don't need to be you don't need to emulate Gary Vee, even if you, if you know, did some of what he's doing, 
and just kind of became the Gary, the Gary V of your market, which is probably smaller than Gary's market. Um, and just you had just created on even on a smaller scale, but consistently and for your target audience uh, would probably create some really good traction for you. Uh, but if you ever feel like you want to be inspired by somebody who's setting the best example as a personal brand at content marketing, I think Gary's somebody to, uh, you might not agree with what he says. He offends a lot of people in his content, but the system exists for promoting his content very, very effectively. So it's worth emulating that system. So the final step in the process, if you go through all this trouble with creating content to grow your audience, um, that is just a vanity metric if you don't, if you can't tie it to generating leads for your business. So there's two things that I wanted to touch on. And then if there's any questions on this stuff, I'm happy to, to go deeper. The first is list building. So anytime you're putting out content where the goal is just to get views or get traffic or get, get, um, get engagement, the next step for somebody that consumes your content should always be to grab something that puts them on your email list. Um, that's often called a lead magnet. Or you can just call it a free resource. But what that does is if all the people that consume your content are given the opportunity to give you their email address in exchange for something, then that separates the people that are just kind of casual, you know, they consume your stuff and all oh, that's nice, but they're not, they're not, um, they're not moving forward in that buyer's journey. Like they're not, they're not in the process of deciding if they want to work with you or not. So the way that you separate the people in your audience from just the casual followers who are not ready yet from the ones that are at least willing to see what you've got is you got to get them, you got to get the lead. Right. So what I recommend for creating a lead magnet is create a, uh, a free resource, downloadable resource that is very quick to consume and helps them implement a part of your process, a part of what you help somebody do. So I'd like to like you to think of your core offer, whatever it is that you help uh, a client accomplish. That's the core offer. That's the whole puzzle. So a lead magnet should take one piece of that puzzle. Uh, and you trade that for somebody's uh, contact information. So in my case, I'll just, I'll give you an example because I help entrepreneurs with creating and distributing their content. One piece of that puzzle is choosing their topics. So one of my lead magnets is a topic ideas worksheet. Does that make sense? Because if somebody grabs that worksheet, I know that they're, that tells me, okay, this person wants to create content. I just help them solve the problem of coming up with topics. Once they've, identify topics the next step for them is creating and promoting content so that's where i can come in with other training and resources and, um, to move them further along in that journey so you want to think through when you give away free resources is that something that your ideal client can use and by giving it to them does that tell you that they're that they're um further along in their journey of of, of uh of becoming a client Are there, does it, any questions on that? Yeah, question. At what point in your relationship path did you put this uh, landing page or lead magnet? So ideally you have a lead magnet before you even start creating content so that from day one, the next step is there. Um, if you've already got a bit of an audience on social media uh, from you know however you've built that audience, um, what I recommend doing is what I call a two-step post. So uh, do a post saying, hey, I'm gonna create this resource. If you want it, when it's ready, leave a comment below. So that way you're kind of pre-selling even your free resources. I've, I'm kind of risk, risk adverse as an entrepreneur, so I don't create stuff that I don't prove that there's demand for. And I'm not just talking about products or services. Like in the past six months, everything that I created, I went and first made sure that there were some people that wanted it. That uh, goes for webinars. Before I recorded, I said, hey, I'm thinking of creating some training on this. Would this be helpful? Before I created worksheets, I said, hey, I'm thinking of making a worksheet about this. Would this be helpful? And so um, getting the validation up front that you're actually creating something that would, would help your target audience is probably the, the first step. But then once you've got it, anyone that consumes your content, if you set up the tracking, you can, you can retarget them, um, which is the second part of this is running ads to whatever your lead magnet is, but targeting people that already consumed your content. So you're no longer targeting people that don't know who you are, hoping that they're interested, hoping that you got the targeting right. 
um, you just you you literally build up an audience of people that have watched your videos or visited your website or read your articles you build up that that pool of people and then those are the people that you show your ads to for the that next step in whatever in, in your sales funnel or your marketing funnel question yes how do you set up retargeting how do you know who has seen your website read an article if they haven't signed up for your email so you don't you don't know them by name, but you can set up the tracking so that um, like Google, for example, um, if you set it up in Google Analytics, that would be for your website. But even on social media, on Facebook, for example, if you're uh, sharing videos from your Facebook page, um, Facebook tracks who's watching these videos, right? So that when you go to run ads, you can choose to run your ads to people that have watched even beyond a certain point. Um, in your videos. So I didn't I don't want to go too deep into the weeds there, but know that it is possible you can you, you can build up these audience uh, This audience of people that have consumed your content. You just don't know them by name yet You don't know exactly who they are Which is why you run the ad to try to get them as a lead because then you'll know who then you figure out who they are You get their contact information after that Um, okay, cool. So there, there are some free reads. I know I've, I've covered quite a bit here. Um, for every one of these steps in the process, I've got a, a, a worksheet that highlights it all um, and some other resources as well. Some templates for tracking content that you're creating, all that stuff. So if you go to this, this link, tylerbassu.com slash gifts, um, if you want that stuff, just enter your email and that'll, my, my system will send you all those free resources right away. If you have any questions for me, feel free to reach out. Uh, I'm the only guy with this name that I know of, like on earth. So if you search for Tyler Basu on social media, uh, you'll find me and I'd be happy to hear from you and answer any questions that you may have. What, was this helpful for you? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. We'll hang around for Q&A if there's any questions, right? Roger's going to come up and uh, say a few things. Turn off. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Well, on behalf of... Uh, you say we, we share the same box? Okay. On behalf, luckily, we're the same height. On behalf of that VBN, Tyler, thank you so much for sharing this uh, knowledge with us. No problem. It's, um, it's hugely valuable to have uh, one person collect it all into a little 45, 50 minute slot, yeah. uh, organize, illustrated with slides, uh, and I'm certain that every one of us is very appreciative for you for summarizing this very complex subject into yeah. very understandable terms. So Thank we you. appreciate that very much. Thanks, Rod. Appreciate it. How are we doing for time? Oh, good. We've got, um, it's